So I would just like to quickly really start off with uh, the talk of today and the topic about inter-individual brain variability. And this is a very interesting and, in my opinion, very important topic when we try to understand the human brain. And the reason for that is the following. When we look at the brain, particularly how it ages from younger to very old subjects, and you see here just an example of how the brain might look like over the ages of, say, about 20, 30 years, and then you move on to the right side and you see the older brain. You immediately see that the brain structure, which is here visible on a coronal slide through the brain with a magnetic resonance imaging depiction, that there are, this is the normal brain tissue, that you see the so-called sulci and the um, parts of the brain which are filled with cerebral spinal fluid, so basically with water in black, that they widen. And the rest in the normal brain tissue here, this grayish part, is shrinking. And this is the normal trend, typically. Not that pronounced in all of the brains, but in principle, that is what happens. But not only our brain declines in brain structure, but also shows some reorganizations in terms of its functional architecture. What does that mean? We do have functional brain networks, which, as you can see here down in the bottom part, which are composed of different brain regions. For example, here on the left side view of the brain, you see here a brain network in parts with the frontal regions of the frontal cortex of the brain, partly the parietal cortex, and parts here down here with the occipital cortex. They work together and form a network, in this case, for um, doing a task of working memory. So remembering a few things for a very short amount of time. And you see here in the upper row, the typical network of a younger subject when doing this task. And in the bottom row, a typical older subject when doing the task. And you immediately see that in general, the network, when you compare these two guys over here on the left, is in principle similar, but there are major differences and very important differences. For example, when you focus here on the top view of the brains, which is uh, highlighted by the encircled regions here, you see, for example, more activation, more contribution of brain regions in the older subjects as compared to the younger subjects in this part of the brain. And this just shows you that the older brain is not just declining in structure, but also has some reserve capacity to compensate for the potential structural decline and the loss of neuronal tissue, which might happen to fulfill its normal functions to hold up the normal functional um, tasks as best as possible so that also the older subjects are able to do the normal everyday tasks. But now comes the major but. This is not just a linear trend, no, not a linear trajectory from younger, as you see here in this depiction, to older subjects. And this is just a depiction of the brain volume here on the y-axis. But what is particularly interesting in these two graphs here, two plots, is that in older subjects, the variability dramatically increases. So if you have a younger subject, 30 years, 40 years, most of the subjects have approximately the same brain volume. While if you move over to the older subjects, you have a higher inter-individual variability. So there might be subjects with particularly low brain volume and others for uh, those the brain looks still like a 40 or 50 year old subject. And you can just uh, quantify that in a different way. On the right side, you see a depiction of the atrophy rate per year. This is again for the younger subjects quite comparable, about 0.5% with a little part of variability. And as you move over to the particularly older subjects, you see a lot of variability. The um, change rate per year increases, but also the variability increases. And again, the same is true for the functional side of the brain, the functional brain networks. You see here again, examples of two brain networks. Here again, a similar one as we just saw before with now a transversal brain slice view. We see a frontal brain region and a parietal brain region working together, the so-called frontal parietal network. And as another example, the so-called executive network with 
parts of the frontal cortex working together. And what you see here again on the x-axis is the age of the subjects. And then on the y-axis, in this case, not the brain volume, but the functional connectivity. So the relatedness of the different brain regions working together and how close and how tight they work together. And this increases over time, over age. But what is particularly interesting is that it, the variability between subjects increases as well in both examples. So our problem mainly is we do know that there is a lot of inter-individual variability, particularly over the course of aging, but age itself might not be the most important factor explaining this variability as we just saw it. Age itself just explains parts of the linear trend, but there's much more to the data. And just recently, over the last couple of years, there was a trend towards more large-scale brain data initiatives because if you would like to capture the inter-individual variability, you need loads of data, tons of data actually, because all each individual if, uh, factor might only explain tiny parts of the variability. And to capture this tiny part, you need lots of data. And this is the reason why we have initiatives like, for example, the UTNI database, the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative from the US, for example, or we do have the Enigma Consortium about genetic associations with brain phenotypes, collecting data from all over the world in association with genetic variables, or as one of the most prominent ones and the largest ones, the UK Biobank from the UK, where they collect in total, finally, about 100,000 subjects scanned with MR imaging, and they have all of these different data around it. Similar um, approach is taken in Germany. This is the label over here, the NACO, the national cohort in Germany, which will end up with 30,000 subjects imaging data, as well as all these other additional data. And the 1,000 brains data set is a little smaller, and this is the one I will focus on a bit more today. This is the data set from the research center in Jülich, where we focus particularly on the older subject age range. So above 55 years until 85 years. And we will see how that older brain is affected by the different influencing factors that you all see around here. The problem is all of these factors are highly intercorrelated. So it's not easy to tackle these problems from a statistical point of view but we have to go into that direction to capture the variability because in the final end, and this is why we are all in the human brain project, we would like to capture the variability for finally creating some brain modeling. And if you would like to model a system like the human brain, which is particularly difficult in itself, you also need to consider the variability information. So first question I would like to tackle today is, isn't it just enough to pool data, because you might have heard that we all, all over the world in different uh, institutes do have a lot of data lying around. All of us have done neuroimaging. So we just put them all together like the Enigma consortium does and just analyze all the data together. I would like to show you an example from a recent study from our lab, why this might be partially a good idea to do so, but why this might also miss part of the story. And here you see an example of data from the 1000 brain study, which I just introduced to you from the research center in Jülich, in comparison to another cohort, which also focus on, focuses on aging, which is the so-called LHUB study from the University of Zurich in Switzerland. And both these cohorts focus on the older subject range, so 60, 65 years and 80, until 85 years. And we here analyze the brain structure in both cohorts in one of the functional brain networks. You see the participating regions in this functional brain network depicted in here in these colorful um, regions. And when we now just compare the brain structure in these frontal parts, in these two green regions, in the 1000 brains data set, this is the blue dots and lines, and in the Zurich, the Switzerland data set, this is the red one, we just see that there is no age-related change at all. From 65 to 85 years, the 
these brain regions do not decline in their brain structure, either left or right. But we now see that in these more posterior regions, so here's the frontal part of the brain, here are the posterior regions, that in all these posterior regions, we do see a particular decline of the brain structure over age. And this is true for all the regions and for the two cohorts. So we do see the same general trend for the two cohorts. So just answering the question, is it possible to pool data in terms of analyzing age effects? Yes, in principle, it seems to be possible. Now comes the but. You already see that here is quite some variability between the two lines uh, with the individual dots, and that also the lines are not completely identical, obviously. So there is much more to it, obviously. And I would just like to show you that on an example of a cognitive test, not on the brain side, which was particularly similar, but for a cognitive test. A cognitive test about general reasoning. And what you see here is how these different um, effectors or different factors, which might be relevant for, the, uh, for explaining variability between subjects in this test, might affect the cognitive performance. And age as a factor is partially important when you pool the data. So this is the pooled line across both studies. While education is a bit more important and the other factors like gender and physical and mental well-being are not that important. Now, when we separate the two lines again for the 1000 brains data set and the LHUB data set, we do see a little different story. We see a bit more within the data. We see that for the Zurich, the LHUB study, we have a lot of effect of the factor age itself, not so much for the other factors. While if we move over to the 1000 brains data set, major parts of the variability in this particular cognitive test were explained by education. So if we pull the data, the green line again, if we pull the data together, we might generally see that age is an important factor and education might be an important factor, but we definitely miss the individual population relevant factors which might explain differences between the, in this case, German, Western German uh, population of the 1000 brains study and the Switzerland population in Zurich. And you can obviously enlarge that to the broader world if you compare, for example, uh, European or Asian or whatever kind of populations which might have different lifestyles, different habits and so on and so forth. And this is not only true for the cross-sectional comparisons, because what I just showed you is a cross-sectional design comparing just data from one time point in two studies. But also if you compare the longitudinal trajectories of these brain structural features in those two different studies. And this is again for the 1000 brains data set from Jülich and from the Zurich data set in Switzerland. And you see here the annual percentage change in brain structure, in this case, in cortical thickness. And you see mainly in blue, there is a decline in brain structure over age. Longitudinally, so two time points per subject put together and analyzed for the two cohorts. You generally see that the larger trends are the same, but there might be slight differences. There is more pronounced, pronounced effects in the Zurich sample less pronounced effects in the 1000 brains data set, for example. And you see that if you compare the different brain regions in more detail, that some brain regions show more variability in the 1000 brains data set. These are the blue ones in here. And some show more variability in the LHUB, the Zurich data set, depicted in the red and light red regions here. In general, we could observe that the um, 1000 brains data set had a broader variability or a wider variability as compared to the Zurich data set. So that these are parameters that you need to include in your considerations when studying inter-individual variability. And particularly longitudinal approaches are quite helpful to tackle these problems. Coming to the second aspect, the genetic risk, because if we would like to focus on different factors influencing inter-individual variability, the genetic risk might be part of the story. And I would just like, like to give you one example on that, just to introduce the topic. We know that 
brain structure, and this is depicted down here for different uh, sulci and gyri of the brain, is heritable. So we can, in terms of the genetic endowment of all of us, we do have some genes which define, at least partially, how our brain looks like. And assessing that, we finally just see, and this is just to, to let you know again uh, what we already discussed, that over age, you see a decline in the cortical thickness. These are the red lines here for the left and right hemispheres. And a widening of the sulci. These are the blue dots here for the different uh, regions of the brain, which are depicted down here. So you see this declining, structural declining effect that I just showed you in the first slide. But parts of it are heritable. So we can analyze genetic variants because if there were, would not be any heritability of brain structure, it would not make any sense to focus on this particular factor. And we did that uh, in terms of the normal aging aspect in our 1000 brains data set and asked ourselves the questions, do we see changes in brain structure which might be comparable to those observed in Alzheimer's disease when we just consider those genetic factors which are known to contribute to the occurrence of Alzheimer's disease? but in subjects which are not diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And you see here the results of this analysis. Again, the brain structure here, a depiction from the right side view of the brain here from the left side view. And this is a medial view of the left and right hemispheres. And you just see that these particular brain regions here in the central part of the brain, in the posterior temporal part and in the occipital part show decline in association with the load of genetic risk for, for getting Alzheimer's disease. Only the risk for that. Again, these subjects have not been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. They just have the genetic factors which might, in the end, contribute to the occurrence of Alzheimer's disease. And the more of those factors you have, the worse your risk is. And we just did that not only for the overall score, for the overall genetic risks, risk that is present in the subjects, but also for different subscores. And the most important one that you might have heard of already is the APOE phenotype, or genotype in this case, which um, is particularly prominent and particularly important for uh, the risk for Alzheimer's disease. And you just see that mainly this overall trend that we saw on the left side for the overall analysis is mainly already visible when we just consider the APOE genotype and not all the other genetic factors. If we include other factors again, for example, parts which contribute to the cholesterol metabolism and parts which co contribute to the Alzheimer's protein metabolism, then you see again a similar picture, but some additional brain regions which pop up and show some association with these genetic factors. So overall, we can just say that normal brain variability might be explained already by factors which might in the end be relevant for disease settings. This is the major outcome of this study. And now in the uh, third part, I would like to show you a few examples of other factors because genetics are one part of the story, but not the only part of the story when we talk about inter-individual variability. We need to consider things like our environment, our lifestyle, our habits, what we have experienced throughout our life, all that um, influences our brain. And just to show you at the beginning, a uh, very, in my opinion, very nice example, how you can approach that, an example from the UK Biobank, from this large endeavor of analyzing um, the, not only the brain, also parts of the rest of the body, but in, for our purpose here, the brain in relation to um, other factors. And this is a very nice depiction, again, of now functional brain architecture. What you see here in the little uh, depictions on the outer part of the circle are um, brain networks. And you see the connections of these brain networks between each other. This is what these um, colorful uh, lines in the middle show. So connectivity, as you would call that, connectivity between brain regions and between brain networks. And what the people from the UK Biobank did 
was they just correlated these and other brain measures. This, this is just one example. They also correlated the brain structure with all the available external factors they have about the subject, all the information. For example, here about lifestyle, when you look here at this violet part, lifestyle, food and drink habits, alcohol consumption, tobacco consumption, but also here in the more dark red part, physical activity in general and physical um, appearance like bone density and body size or cardiac um, uh, fitness or things like that, cardiac health and, and et cetera, other things. And these are two, two examples of how you can extract functional connectivity data, one on the top, one on the bottom, and you see the same picture. Most parts might be explained here mainly by the physical appearance and the physical connectivity of the subject. Parts might also be explained here by the yellow part here by lifestyle, exercise and work. And some other variability might be explainable by other lifestyle factors or cognitive phenotypes. So this is more like all correlated with everything. This was a very broad approach. And the problem here is with these large data sets, you immediately get significant results. This is nice. But this also shows the problem that if you would like to analyze large data sets, a p-value might not be the only informative part. This is just to give you an overview. Now, with such a an, an broad analysis, it might be interesting to focus a bit more on parts of these different stories here to particularly understand what exactly these factors contribute to the brain variability. And this is what, what I would like to show you in uh, two examples, one again from the UK Biobank and one from our 1000 Brains dataset. And in the UK Biobank, they analyzed here in more detail the effect that cardiovascular risk factors have on brain structure or how they are associated with brain structure. And what you just see here is the aggregate effect of the overall cardiovascular risk and what contributes to that comes in a few seconds. And you see mainly the main major result is most of the brain is somewhat affected by the cardiovascular risk, which makes sense because then your um, brain, your blood vessels might be affected and that might affect in turn the brain itself and the blood supply to the brain at the, that might affect the brain tissue. If you then analyze these different factors which are all known cardiovascular risk factors like smoking, hypertension, diabetes, the body mass index, so your relation between body weight and body height, and the so-called waist-hip ratio as a more detailed, more refined measure of the BMI, you see that all of them contribute, obviously, to the relation between risk factor and brain tissue or brain structure, but they contribute to a different degree. For example, the waist hip ratio might explain larger parts of the variability, similarly the BMI, while hypertension might only explain less parts of the variability. And they also did that not only for the brain structure in general, but also for the so-called white matter tracts, so the structural connections which run through the brain and connect the different brain regions, and they see similar effects here you see some examples of those tracts in a right side view of the brain and uh, these different, differently colored uh, tracts are different parts of the white matter tracts. And it just shows you that there is also a relation between cardiovascular risk and the structure of these white matter tracts. So cardiovascular risk, we could have imagined that, but nevertheless, it was nicely shown in this very large study here with over 10,000 subjects that there is indeed a quite prominent correlation. But if you consider things like lifestyle, cardiovascular risk is also obviously um, a lifestyle problem, partially at least. We saw that smoking comes in and uh, the body mass index, so our weight and in relation to height. You might also think that we do not only have one lifestyle habit. We typically have different lifestyle habits. And the problem in previous, in smaller and previous studies, typically was that only one or two factors were considered at once. So you analyze the relation between, for example, smoking and brain health. But you can imagine that people do not only smoke, 
but also drink alcohol, they are physically active, do sports, and they are socially integrated, for example. And if you consider that as an overall lifestyle um, concept for each of us, then you might want to consider all of these factors together when analyzing their effect on the brain. And we did that in a recent study in the 1000 Brains dataset, and we constructed a so-called lifestyle risk score. And you see that down here in the depiction on the left, these four factors went into the lifestyle risk score. And we assumed based on previous studies that physical activity and social integration are very healthy, protective factors, while smoking and alcohol consumption might be not so good for the brain. And you see down here our subjects on the x-axis and we see that some subjects are obviously on the more healthy side of the world. They are physically active and they are socially engaged, while others are more on the risky side of life. More smoking, more alcohol, less physical activity. And when we correlate this risk score, which we just constructed for each subject, we see a, an association with brain structure in particularly two brain regions. One in the, here you know, on the left side view of the brain in the premotor region, so the motor part of the brain, the motor cortex, and one down here on the right side of the brain in the prefrontal region. This is just, first of all, the general e effect that we saw. But we now ask ourselves, if this is the general effect of the overall lifestyle risk, can we disentangle which of these four factors contributes most to this association? And we did that by, a, by an approach which is quite common in epidemiological studies. We excluded one of the factors after each other. And this stepwise exclusion approach led us to the following. You see here again the overall result that I just showed you in the previous slide and in the colors, the different factors. And we now excluded, first of all, the factor social integration. We only constructed a risk score now based on physical activity, alcohol consumption, and smoking. When we do that and redo the analyses um, for the association with brain structure, we see that this prefrontal cortex association that we had here before completely disappears, while this premotor region still is there. This led to the conclusion that obviously this part in the prefrontal cortex might be mainly driven by the factor social integration, because otherwise it would have still been there even when we exclude this factor. To be sure that this conclusion is correct, we constructed all the other three risk factor solutions. You see them down here. So we excluded each of the other factors from the risk score and recalculated the analyses again. And you see that in all the cases where the social integration is in, you see at least parts of the prefrontal cortex being in the final result. So what about the motor cortex then? First of all, you would think that maybe if we exclude physical activity, then the motor cortex should disappear because obviously physical activity, motor performance might be related. Unfortunately, when we only take a look at those uh, risk factor solutions where physical activity, the yellow one here is in there, we see in all of them the motor cortex association, that's correct, but we also see it when the physical activity is not in there on the right side here. So the problem is we need obviously to exclude another factor and we did that and excluded as a second factor the alcohol consumption. So we only constructed risk scores based on uh, social, like, social integration and smoking. And now you see the association here in the premotor cortex disappeared. Lucky us. Just to reconfirm again, if we have one of the other factors in there, either physical activity and alcohol consumption, or one of those in this two-factor solution, we see at least partially the association with the premotor cortex again. So our conclusion would be the prefrontal region would be mainly driven by social integration, while the premotor cortex association would be mainly driven by a combination of physical activity and alcohol consumption. And we not only did that for the brain structure, but also for the functional connectivity. And interestingly, if we do the very same excluding parts of the factors, we see that mainly smoking is the driving factor here in terms of the functional architecture of the brain. And we also included the genetic risk and we see that the overall results do not change. So in this particular study, we would say that 
nurture and nature do not wage each other out, but nurture might be more important. The nature, the genetics, might be not important for explaining the association between lifestyle and brain. And we followed up on this particular analysis to better understand how much the brain is affected by these different lifestyle factors. And we, for that, we just chose a different approach, actually, because we looked at a construct which is called the brain age score, a machine learning approach which tries to estimate how old your brain looks based only on the image of the brain without knowing the age. And you see here on the x-axis the chronological, so the real age of the subject, and on the y-axis the estimated age based on the brain image. And this is a particularly a very nice correlation in principle, but you see that the variability is quite high. And you see, for example, a subject down here, this particular circle is in real life about 60 years of age, but the brain looks like about a 45-year-old subject, so much younger. And the opposite view when you look at the dots which are above the line. And parts of that variability could be explained by lifestyle again. And we just correlated this score, so the deviation from this midline, with our lifestyle risk score. And this is a very tiny association, I have to say. So small effects, as I said in the beginning, all of these factors only show small effects. But nevertheless, we see an association. And we can just calculate based on this regression line that you add about four months of brain age to your brain if you have a higher lifestyle risk score. If you disentangle that again for the different lifestyle factors, and the most prominent one which came out of that was smoking, you add only with smoking about 0.4 months, so really few days. But nevertheless, you add days to your brain age score if you smoke more. So now to the final part, the functional reorganization, which I already mentioned a few times. What is quite interesting about all of this general reorganization or the general atrophy of the brain is that it's too short-sighted if you just talk about the brain declines. I already showed you that. Interestingly, we do see that in the normal aging process, particularly those subjects, uh, those parts of the brain which have been added to the brain in terms of evolution, the latest, decline the first. So it's called the principle of last in, first out. So these particularly brain regions are vulnerable to the aging process, so to say. And interestingly, this fits nicely with, as, um, with experiments about where particularly uh, the glycolysis of the brain is particularly elevated. So the energy consumption is really high, where is one of the large functional brain networks is located here, the so-called default mode network, a typical resting state network. So when your brain does not do anything in particular, this particular network is active. And where you see the typical amyloid depositions when uh, the brain ages and shows some neurodegenerative um, changes in terms of approaching Alzheimer's disease or any kind of dementia. And you see similar changes in the decreased glucose metabolism as the brain ages. So there is not the same consumption of the major feeding factor, the glucose, in the older brain. Interestingly, in the older subjects in particular, these brain regions that you just saw before, which are so-called the association brain regions of the frontal, the parietal, and the temporal cortex are not that much affected anymore. They have already declined. But we see that in this study, we focused on all of the different brain networks. Here again, you see them depicted in different colors uh, and labeled with these um, letters here. And these different brain networks show some decline. But the major important part here is that the somatomotor network, a primary network, which is important for our movements and for feeling touch, for example, and the visual network, show particularly declines. This is depicted here by these uh, scattered lines, they show declines in their connectivity, so in their functional architecture. This is the major story. So not the association regions, so all of these regions over here have been mainly affected in these very old subjects, but we see then also affections of the primary networks. 
this is a very important part that has been shown by other studies as well, that when you look at the older, oldest uh, subjects, then you see particularly affections of the primary networks themselves. So first, the more vulnerable ones are declining, and then finally also the more stable ones. And just to show you a final example on that, you can also go further into that, and that uh, hopefully feeds over to the last a few slides because I would like to show you what we would like to do in terms of brain modeling based on all of that, that you cannot only consider functional connectivity as a static view, but you can also analyze the dynamics of that. And you see here on the left side, examples of the functional connectivity dynamics. So the correlation between 20 minutes of functional activity with each with, it, with itself, so with time point one and time point two of one subject in a younger subject and a mid-age subject and an older subject. And you immediately see that this dynamics change as the brain gets older. So there is again an example of functional reorganization over age. And this is also depicted here when you do that um, for different time windows. So you can have different window sizes of how much of the functional activity you would like put to, to put together. You do that in the long run, like from one to five minutes time, or you do that in the shorter ranges, 15 seconds to 60 seconds or six to 15 seconds. And in all of these depictions, you see that the younger subjects show more peaks. They are faster to the right, while the older subjects show some decline. They get slower in this dynamics and in the velocity of these dynamics. And as I said, this leads over to the final goal, the brain modeling. What are we doing here in, human, in the Human Brain Project? This is the so-called workbench that we just imagined. This is where we would like to go to. Um, we would like to feed in all this imaging data and all we have, all we know about the brain together with all the different individual factors and then have some models. And this is where we are currently working on in a user interface within the so-called eBrains platform that you will hear about a bit more uh, today and tomorrow. And we would like then to finally come up with models on the individual level and also on a cohort level. So we just try to understand the variability and all the brain features as best as possible to end up with models which might be able to then tune the parameters of these models and learn about the brain within the models to finally go back, for example, to patients to optimize therapy. That would be an idea. And with that, I would like to end and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>